Welcome to Polkadot Insider. I'm Pia, and today I am with a very special guest, Thibault. He is the VD of Bifrost. Thank you so much for coming. Lovely to be here. Thank you for the invite. So we're in the middle of the C blockchain week. Uh, is it busy for you? Crazy schedule? Yeah, it's been a bit busy. You know, the last two weeks been on the road, Hong Kong, Tokyo are now here, but it's nice to be here. Obviously, important region in terms of like DeFi activity, crypto adoption, and there's obviously, you know, a lot of regulatory sort of positives from the different regions in the Southeast Asia, and a lot of innovation and, you know, dev community is quite big here, especially in Vietnam, which you're familiar with. So we're happy to sort of be here uh, in Bangkok to be at, at this event for the first time. So how does it feel uh, like doing all the panels here? <laughs> Yeah, it's been good. Like, you know, I was on a panel this morning about uh, revitalizing DeFi over CeFi with a few cool guests, you know, um, Monad, which is a pretty popular, I'd say, uh, alternative L1 now, Paralyzed EVM, and a few other protocols. And I think generally speaking, I mean, this region is super interesting. You know, I think there are a few catalysts which are positive for the space. You know, youth, high sort of, you know, internet connectivity. Um, people are unbanked. So there's a, a real like need for crypto adoption. Um, however, I think we're still very much in the first innings of that, and um, we're seeing you know, regulatory disparities amongst, amongst the countries, but frameworks starting to build out. Some countries are more mature than others, like Singapore. Thailand, I think, are, are, are being a bit more like, strict as well in terms of protecting uh, retail. Um, so I think it's still a, it's a good period to come. You know, the market is, obviously, sentiment is there, and I think it's important to be in these regions to understand sort of like local um, intricacies amongst these, these southeastern you know, regions. So yeah, happy to be here. Okay, so uh, walk us through Bifrost for the non-tech. Yeah, so Bifrost is a dedicated liquid staking L1, right? So we have you know, a protocol built on top of Polkadot. So Polkadot is like the layer zero, okay. and we are the layer one on top of that. Um, substrate based. We chose Substrate for its you know, flexibility uh, customizability around that, uh, tailor-made sort of for, for what we want to do, which is liquid staking. Mm -hmm. And the reason, I think we came quite early on in the liquid staking sort of narrative. Like we've been building liquid staking sort of solution on Ethereum first, when uh, obviously liquid staking wasn't as big as it is now, you know, in terms of DeFi uh, sort of subsector. Um, we've been in the space for like four or five years now, building. We're now the biggest on Polkadot on that front. And I think Polkadot was just the clearest like option in terms of where we want to be built, you know, in terms of where do we want to leverage on, and then how do we look within that sector in the next couple of years. So I think, you know, shared security, interoperability amongst parachains, and now we're seeing, you know, more interoperability amongst different blockchains coming to Polkadot as well, which we can speak about a bit later on. But I think liquid staking is a, is a key primitive, and I think we're doing uh, very well in terms of building on top of that and, and bringing that to Polkadot and, and expanding as well. I think liquid staking is like a big narrative and uh, a lot of other projects, they also do the same. Uh, so what's the benefits? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think we've seen, right, post Chappella, liquid staking, obviously very important. Lido has significant market share on Ethereum. Ethereum remains sort of like number one blockchain in terms of like where the TVL is, like onboarding as well. We're seeing a proliferation out of L2s, uh, non-EVM L1s, paralyzed EVMs trying to optimize for what EVM is currently doing. Um, so I think liquid staking remains a very, very key, you know, value add, value offering service, which is not going to die out. It's got clear market fit. I think our angle here is, you know, we've highlighted and we've seen that there are limitations to smart contract deployments on, on one chain. So we've gone about like choosing from like, you know, the tech up, right? We think that liquid staking is a base layer primitive to you know, bootstrapping ecosystems in terms of on-chain activity and, and use cases on, on a specific eco ecosystem and uh, the on-chain economy. And I think with the guarantees of Polkadot, you know, shared security, interoperability with XCM, um, it's a clear, you know, clear interesting you know, value proposition. So I think that's where we're different. I, I would say maybe someone else in the market which is gaining traction uh, on Cosmos side is, is Stride. And I think we're very similar to Stride in terms of our strategic positioning, you know, as a dedicated liquid staking app chain. It's just that they're leveraging off Cosmos IBC and we're leveraging off Polkadot. And we obviously think Polkadot has more, you know, security guarantees. So we, we think we have a more, um, I would say, secure. And, you know, we, we definitely think that as things play out, uh, we'll, we'll come to see that, you know, that has paid off, you know, that choice. And Earlier that's on. also like one uh, aspect when you choose, that's why you choose Polkadot to build uh, the Bifrost on? Yeah, so I mean, as I said, Substrate was obviously a key, um, key decision, right? In terms of like building these customized 
um, sort of you know frameworks on top of on top of Bifrost. We think that there's a flexibility there. There's the security. There's the modularity as well. And we think that you know with with runtime upgrades and everything, you're not sort of completely you know, putting your blockchain to risk on that front. You know, it's not as we're seeing with smart contract deployments and, and other things on EVM. Uh, so I think that, you know, that, that's been a clear, important thing on the building side. And I think essentially, like, we're, we're coming to a point now, you know, you look at Celestia on the DA front, right? We're seeing Eigenlayer as well. You know, we're seeing all this liquid restaking, restaking, all that stuff. A lot of that essentially came from Polkadot, essentially, right? I think uh, Nick White, the co-founder of Celestia, yesterday posted saying, this is a bit of a non-consensus view, but he said the first restaking protocol was, was Polkadot. Essentially, I mean, whether or not it's restaking essentially is, is obviously debatable. I think there's no re-hypothecation in, in Polkadot, but essentially, yeah, your, your stake in Polkadot is securing other chains, parachains. So I think that, you know, without going on a, on a, on a long one, um, Polkadot obviously has its tech, you know, uh, value, off, value offering in terms of security, interoperability. And I think these are key as a base layer to like building out. And I think now with you know the move to core time and jam as, as Gavin spoke about, we'll have to see how that plays out. But um, liquid staking is here to stay for sure. You're also expecting core time. Everyone's expecting it. Yeah. yeah they need some chains. Yeah, I think core time is obviously you know the way forward in terms of like trying to onboard, you know, and, and seamlessly integrate uh, Polkadot. How that looks for us down the line is is obviously unclear still. Um, but I obviously think that maybe our service around liquid staking core time is something that can be leveraged. You know, uh, VDOT, which is our dot liquid staking token, in terms of being a currency for buying and selling core time can be one. We are discussing with, with Lastic, which is um, a marketplace for core time, uh, for block space, about, you know, potential product offerings around leveraging, you know, VDOT. So we are trying to sort of see around the product ideation, like what can be done around core time. But uh, for now, I think what we're focusing on essentially is building TVL on Polkadot, educating the ecosystem, and building more use cases uh, within Polkadot and outside. Yeah. How about uh, restaking? It's, a, it's not a new concept yeah. though, but it's trending. So what's your thoughts on restaking? Yeah, I think restaking is obviously, as, as I just alluded to, I think restaking is not new. You know, we've seen instances of restaking, whatever you want to call it, with Polkadot, you know. What do you think that it's make it trendy this year? Sure. Well, I think number one is Eigenlayer, right? Um, obviously, a lot of uh, attention about Eigenlayer and what Sriram is doing there with the team around, you know, leveraging off the trust, you know, marketplace of Ethereum and, and sort of building on top of that. Um, I think what's been misunderstood is around the risks around it, right? I think leveraging off trust is one thing. Uh, that's not a, an issue, right? It's then more about the rehypothecation, right? So I think what Eigenlayer is doing and trying to connect with other blockchains, you know, we're seeing the AVSs, right? Which are the validator, you know, these services on top of Eigenlayer, um, which in, in essence you're restaking into, right? Uh, a bit like a, a validator or, or a collator. Um, it's still unclear, right? What's going on there? So I think, you know, that's number one a bit of unclarity regarding how that works with the AVSs. Who is the one delegating to the AVSs? What is their criteria around delegation of, of the stake of the, you know, the restaked asset? Like, what are you restaking into? And I think another thing which we've seen two days ago with Renzo, right? Renzo is one of the large, what, largest LRTs, liquid restaking tokens in, in the game. We've seen that there has been a liquidation event, right? There was a DPEG in their LRT, which happened on DEXs. People were not happy, they sold. A lot of liquidations, and, and I think one of the big risks that we've seen in DeFi, not only about LRTs, but generally speaking, is leverage, right? People are doing, you know, leverage restaking. So basically, they're using their LRT, borrowing against it, re-getting LRTs, and they're playing this loop, I think for the airdrop as well, and that's caused significant risks. So I think my point is, you know, restaking is, is an interesting concept, but um, as everything, you need to be quite cautious of like the risks around that and, and what can be done and achieved. But it's, it's a big narrative, yeah. I think Asia has been a big driver of that narrative on the... Uh, yeah, we go drop. crazy for it, especially yeah, in Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, okay, it cool, is. Cool, cool, cool. So, uh, will Bifrost ever enter restaking? Well, I mean, not restaking as we see it. You know, in a, in a way, um, what Intel have done with IBTC is, is, is one form of restaking, right? Um, you know, securing the bridge, which is, you know, collateralizing assets to bring Bitcoin to Polkadot. That's a form of restaking, frankly. Um, we are one of the largest, VDOT is the largest collateral asset on Interlay. So people are, are moving away from using just DOTs 
and using yield bearing assets like LSTs, liquid staking tokens, to uh, to sort of get collateral against that, you know. So um, whether or not Polkadot will go down the, the actual restaking route as we see it today is 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 probably not going to happen. However, we do think that you know as things become more cross chain and uh, we see you know Eigenlayer working with Cosmos, we're seeing Picasso, which is a, a Kusama parachain doing um, restaking on Solana via Eigenlayer and, and having an AVS. I think there's, there's room for, for opportunity there between Polkadot and other, and other ecosystems around restaking. Yeah, and, and I think whether or not we go in that direction is, is yet to be seen, but I think VDOT or VETH, which is our liquid staking asset for Ethereum, could be a key, um, a key piece of that, you know, in, in terms of that development. So in, in general, you will stay, Bifrost will be like liquid staking, right? Oh, uh, not like not not gonna get to restaking for the meantime. So Bifas is gonna remain a, a key a key actor, mm -hmm. you know, within liquid staking. That's okay. not something we're gonna change. Okay. But in terms of product ideation and seeing like what makes sense and where there's demand, mm -hmm. essentially, you know, our assets could be potentially used with other restaking protocols which might want to build a solution leveraging, you know, Polkadot and Ethereum, for example. Um, okay. That could be a direction we would we would take, but Bifrost in itself is not looking to go down restaking actively. So, uh, what's your expectation about DeFi for three to five years, next three to five years? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think look from a Bifrost perspective, I think we really obviously want to focus on um, you know the user journey, so adoption, and that is still in its early phases, right? So we've we've deployed now things on, on EVM chains where you can basically interact with Bifrost without having to interact with the Bifrost uh, you know, protocol. Um, so you can mint liquid staking assets directly on a, on a different chain. And that's leveraging off XCM, you know, which is fantastic. So I think there's still you know, things around there that has to be you know, improved. I think liquid staking should be embedded um, quite natively in wallets. So that's something where we're speaking with a lot of ecosystem wallets on that front. And I think generally speaking, like. I guess there's two ways of looking at it. There's obviously the degen side where you obviously want to see more primitives being built out, but whether or not that adds value to the average user is, is obviously very debatable. Uh, you know, we, we've seen liquid restaking as a narrative, Bitcoin DeFi, whether or not that takes off is of interest, I don't know. But essentially, I think that we should still focus on, on the user journey and adoption. And, and what that requires is still very much cross-chain abstraction, you know, account abstraction, account aggregation, uh, for the user. So what that means is right now we have blockchains which are optimized, but they're isolated. And we have blockchains with their native communities, right? It's very tribalistic, right? So we're, we're Polkadot, we love Polkadot, everything else we don't like. I mean, I'm, being, I'm exaggerating, but that's the case. The issue is the end user, which is not us in terms of like, you know, the proficient one is us, but I'm talking about the people who are not so sort of familiar. They don't, want, they don't care which blockchain you're on. They, they, they really don't care about that. They want the security guarantees, obviously. They want a few things which have to be guaranteed for their experience. But essentially what's needed is to optimize for, you know, for the, the, the abstraction of the accounts and what chain they're on. And that really requires some sort of you know, work at every layer of the tech stack on the uh, account abstraction side. And I think we're seeing some solutions on that front. In Polkadot, we're seeing you know, uh, Invarch doing something around you know, one, app, one account for the multi-chain, for the cross-chain, which I think is super important. So I'm quite bullish around that, but I still think we're very much in the infancies of, of seeing sort of you know, significant adoption uh, on there. So I think, you know, to cut it short, there's gonna always be these short-term trends around you know, DeFi, around the, you know, DGen stuff, you know, gamified perps, using this type of collateral to do this and this. But in terms of long-term adoption, I think we, we have to focus still on the infra, right? around uh, facilitating onboarding, and, and hopefully we can do that in the next you know, year or two. Can we do one more fun question? Sure. Okay, so people they're saying, they're, they're like, they're debating user and developers. So which size do you think is more important? Or you think it's better to keep a balance? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's really twofold, right? There's synergies there and it's really hand in hand, because essentially you need, you need to understand what the user needs, right? And I think sometimes we are building in an eco chamber where we're building things which are not super relevant mm -hmm. to the end user right now. If your end user is, for example, the guy in the street, you know, who's getting his, his, you know, his monthly salary, like, what does he need? You know, that's really the goal. Like, I think 
that's that's the first question. But then again, you obviously need the developers, right, to, to build those solutions. So it's really a balance of the two, I think. I think we're at a stage now where there are developers, that's for sure, and there's you know there's talent, uh, and there's more and more I think initiatives around bringing more developers to Polkadot, or even just from a country wide level, like regulation around bringing you know more people to build in a specific country and working closely to the government and to you know large. Web2 conglomerates and stuff like that. I've seen that in Vietnam as well, with like airlines onboarding like NF, you know, NFT companies and stuff. But I think the, the essential idea here is it's, it's a bit of both. I still fundamentally think that we need the users more because developers, I mean, you'll find them, right? But we need the right solutions out there. It's, it's absolutely pointless to build of X amount of products of if course. no one's going to use it. So. I think it's hard. It's just it's hard to like actually get to the users and focus on developers at, as sure. well. No, it's, yeah. a, it's a fine line. I think where we started back in the day was, you know, we knew what was needed. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we went down sort of the technical side. Yeah. And now we're focusing more around the product. Like, okay, how Every do we build? Different periods. Yeah, different periods. Yeah. I think that's the right balance. So yeah, users and developers are key. Understood. Okay, uh, Thibault, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for your uh, time, man. I hope that I can see you uh, in the future. Sure, in thank Vietnam. You. GM Vietnam. Okay.